Hello, I'm Rosie Vision. I like to make videos about traditionally girly media. I say girly as an umbrella term, and obviously anyone can enjoy these works. I like to take a closer look and discuss them with you all, but admittedly through slightly rose-tinted glasses. After all, we all deserve a little magic in our life. We're talking about Winx Club again today, and this time I have a topic that I've been dying to cover. I've always loved Winx Club, obviously. And a big reason why is because of the atmosphere that it creates. You wouldn't be able to tell from the most recent seasons of the TV series, but originally Winx Club was clearly supposed to be a dark fantasy. Before we get into it, I'd like to make a quick announcement. I recently opened up a Ko-fi page. I make YouTube videos for fun, but it eats up a lot of time and I pay out of pocket for equipment and research materials. So I made a Ko-fi page as a way to take donations if any of you watching would like to support my channel. Donations will improve the quality of my videos and make it a lot easier to make them. The first goal is to get enough to upgrade my recording setup because it's not the greatest right now. The link to my Ko-fi page is in the description, and it's okay if you can't donate because watching my videos and subscribing helps a lot too. Also, I have an Instagram now. Woo! It's a great way to see if I'm still alive since I have a slower YouTube upload schedule. I'm still figuring out what I want to post, but currently I'm focusing on nostalgic stuff, so go give a follow if you're interested. Okay, back to the video. To address the elephant in the room, I haven't seen Fate the Wink Saga, which went the intentionally dark and edgy route. One, because I really don't want to. From what I've seen and heard, it just isn't my cup of tea. Sorry, uh, I'd be happy to- Mansplain it? No. Sure. Kinda seems like your thing. No! And two, I do get squeamish sometimes, and it sounds like there are some scenes I wouldn't do well with. But that doesn't mean I don't appreciate horror. <laughs> I really like pieces of media that incorporate elements from psychological and Lovecraftian horror. Also, I absolutely love Gothic literature and the Victorian Gothic aesthetic. And surprisingly, the early seasons of Winx Club fit the Gothic aesthetic really nicely. I think it's part of what made me love the genre, honestly. So take notes, Netflix. Winx Club was already plenty dark but in a good way. So today, I'd like to go over all the darker moments of Winx Club. At least all the ones I could remember. To preface, there are a lot of seasons of Winx Club, and I couldn't rewatch everything just for this one video. So forgive me if I forget something obvious. I tried my best to order them from least dark to most, but I did so very loosely. So keep that in mind. And also, there will be spoilers. I am talking about very specific plot points after all, so you've been warned. If any of you watching haven't seen Winx Club yet, I hope this can showcase some of the reasons why I fell in love with the show all those years ago. Maybe you can even check out the first few seasons. They're available in most places on YouTube, so there's not much of an excuse. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's get into it, shall we? Cue the spooky music. 10. Diaspora tries to murder Bloom. This one is kind of an outlier. It's one of the only moments I included from seasons 5 through 8. I feel like this moment is kind of brushed off, and it should have been a bigger deal than it actually was. Let's get some background on Diaspora's character first. Diaspora was Guy's fiance. Apparently, she was trained for many years in a variety of subjects, including combat, in order to become his wife one day. This planned marriage was supported most by Sky's father, presumably for political reasons. 
Once Sky and Bloom meet, they end up liking each other pretty quickly. And they sort of have a thing. But Bloom doesn't know that Sky is the Prince of Arachleon. And he's engaged. Admittedly, a pretty messed up thing to do on Sky's part. Yes, his father is controlling, but still. There should have been bigger repercussions for that. Diaspora and Bloom eventually meet and end up battling it out. In Bloom's defense, she didn't know of Diaspora's existence and was under the impression that Diaspora was actually a witch trying to play mind games on her. Which seems like a stretch if you haven't seen the show, but it actually sort of makes sense. Something similar happened to Bloom not too long ago. Long story short, Bloom makes a fool of herself. She gets upset at Sky, rightfully so, but eventually Sky drops his engagement, as he should have in the first place, and gets back with Bloom. And Diaspora and Bloom have been enemies ever since. Honestly, Diaspora was wronged. She was treated horribly by Sky, yet she's the one painted as a villain. And for some reason, she's still attached to him terribly, which leads her to do some pretty unforgivable stuff in season 3, which leads to her banishment. And by unforgivable stuff, I mean brainwashing Sky into loving her, turning the kingdom against the Lynx, and trying to force a marriage on Sky. So, though initially a victim, Diaspora totally loses it and rightfully gets banished from Arachleon. Until the next years for some crazy reason. I honestly can't remember why, but it had something to do with Sky's father. He made her his liaison in season 5. But like, why? why? Why let her back in the first place? Even the queen questions this decision. I don't know if that was such a good idea, Arendor. Don't! I presume the show wants us to believe that the king of Arachleon has absolute authority even on a decision as stupid as this. But really, he has no reason to like Diaspora anymore. Bloom is a princess now, and a good fit for Skye. So why would the king want Sky to be with Diaspro instead? The girl who literally tried to take over the kingdom using dark magic. The only logical explanation I can think of is that he absolutely hates Bloom and does this just to spite her. But no. No, 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 no. The answer is simply bad writing. Diaspro loses the position, but only because she doesn't want Sky to help out the Winx and she spoke out. Not because of her heinous crimes. But that's enough exposition. Let's talk about the time she tried to kill Bloom. In season 6, Diaspora offers her services to the Tricks, saying she can help them get to Bloom. Selena searches the Legendarium for something to defeat Bloom. She learns of the Vortex of Flames, which lies underneath the Palace of Domino. Its magic is so powerful that not even Bloom, Keeper of the Dragon Flame, can handle it. Throughout time, the Vortex of Flame was used to test a Dragon Flame, but apparently it's gotten more powerful over the years, and Bloom is too weak to handle it in her current state. After learning of the Vortex of Flame, Diaspora mentions how she's been invited to the royal coronation of Daphne in Domino, so she has a way to put the plan into action. The Tricks give the job to Diaspora as a test to see if she's worthy to become one of their allies. Quick side rant here. Why is Diaspora invited to such an event? Yes, she's royalty, but she has committed horrible crimes and was banished from Arachleon. And she did all this because she hates Bloom. Why would Bloom, or her family, ever invite Diaspora to their own kingdom? It makes zero sense. And for some reason, no one bats an eye to her presence. The only ones who seem concerned are the Pixies, and the frickin' animal mascot Kiko for crying out loud. It should be more than sidekick comic relief characters being concerned about this. Oh, I can't. Moving on. Selena summons Fire Eaters to attack during the ceremony. All's going well, but suddenly Bloom collapses. She's weak because she split her power source, the Dragon Flame, into six different parts to share her powers with the rest of the Winx. She doesn't have enough left to sustain herself. 
The Fire Eaters start attacking, so Sky and Thorin take Bloom to safety. Jasper leads them to the Vortex of Flames, telling them it's the only safe place. Once again, I call foul. Sky straight up says he doesn't trust Diaspora, which he shouldn't, and Thorin agrees. Why is he even here if no one trusts her? Oh, okay. Sky gets hit protecting Bloom and passes out. Diaspora abandons him, even though her plan is to get Sky all to herself. Makes sense to me. So Thorn and Diaspora continue off to the Vortex. Sky awakens and tells the rest of the Winx what happened. Daphne explains how Bloom can't handle the Vortex as is, so they rush off to save her. Diaspora and Thorin make it to the Vortex, and Diaspora orders him to throw Bloom into it to restore her powers. Luckily, Daphne and Sky arrive to tell Thorin of Diaspora's evil plan. But regardless, Diaspora uses her magic and throws Bloom into the Vortex, which is a very, very long way down. And Bloom can't even move. And keep in mind, Diaspora is under the impression that the magic of the Vortex will kill Bloom. And it very well could have. You know, if she didn't have plot armor that would even put Mithril to shame. Honestly, the impact of the scene isn't that great because the tone and writing of the season is all over the place. But still, the concept of it deserves a spot on this list. Diaspora straight up had murderous intent and went through with her plan to kill Bloom, the main character. Pretty gutsy move. I remember being shocked when I saw this episode for the first time. Initially because Diaspora was there, yet no one cared. And secondly, I was shocked by what Diaspora had done. Yes, she's done horrid things before, but it never involved straight-up murder. And yet Diaspora isn't locked up permanently? They don't even mention her again in the next episode or for the rest of the season if I remember correctly. Just sunshine and rainbows right after Bloom was almost murdered. And multiple people saw Diaspora launch Bloom into a giant flaming vortex, clearly thinking this would end Bloom's life. That blows my mind. I'm not the only one, right? <laughs> Please let me know your thoughts. I need to know I'm not overthinking things here. Now for the next darkest moment. 9. The Trix's Mind Games on Bloom Back in Season 1, Bloom had no idea of her true origins. She finally learns that she was adopted by her family when they found her in a burning building as a baby. She's extremely unsure of everything. She's recently found out she's a fairy with magical powers. And now she learns she's adopted and she has no idea who her real parents are. The only thing she feels certain about is the Winx and Sky, in her words. Which adds insult to injury when she finds out about Diaspro in a few episodes. Bloom desperately wants to learn about who she is and where she comes from. She believes the answer lies in the archives of Cloud Tower, so she and Skye plan to break into the school to do some digging. Unfortunately, Riven overhears this, who happens to be working for the Trix at this point. So now the Trix know what Bloom's plan to break into Cloud Tower. The Trix plan to trick Bloom into believing something that will crush her spirits. Then they'll comfort her in order to get close, and when Bloom least expects it, they'll steal her powers. Bloom and Sky go through with their plan and make it to the archives of Cloud Tower. They stumble upon a legendary lost book almost immediately, which supposedly answers any question you want to ask. So Bloom takes the opportunity to ask who she really is. She gets shown a vision of the ancestral witches, who are the ones who destroyed Domino. Bloom's home planet. Thanks to the tricks, Bloom is led to believe that she's actually a reincarnation of the Ancestral Witches, a great malevolent force. As soon as she becomes a true fairy, they'll take her away, is what Bloom believes after reading the book. Bloom starts crying from this revelation, and Skye is even initially frightened of her. It's a fairly brief moment, but what the tricks did here was pretty despicable. And it is what leads Bloom to make a fool out of herself when she meets Diaspora for the first time. 
Let's move on to the next one, shall we? 8. Family Drama Honestly, half of the girls have pretty heavy backstories, so I decided to group them all together. This is a long section, so get comfortable. We'll start with Stella. Stella is the Princess of Solaria, and her parents are King Radius and Queen Luna. We don't really know too much about Stella's childhood, but based off of some passing comments and her nightmare sequence in World of Winx, we can assume that she didn't have much confidence to begin with. She became the fashion diva that she is in order to feel better about herself, and fit in better. But that's not what I'm choosing to focus on. Stella has a very close relationship with her father, and from what we can see, he loves her dearly and dotes on her heavily. But in the first season, Stella reveals that her parents are getting divorced. I don't celebrate the Day of the Rose. I've never told you guys, but my mom and dad are splitting up. Yep, the king and queen of Solaria aren't getting along anymore. And we see repeatedly throughout the series that this is something that deeply affects Stella. She puts on a chipper attitude and cracks jokes constantly, but this is clearly eating her up inside. Stella's parents are divorced. She doesn't talk to them much. Oh, I... I didn't know. She pretends not to care about things, but she's really sensitive. Oh. And the writers don't take the easy way out either. The king and queen never get back together. But it goes deeper than Stella dealing with just a divorce. In season 3, Stella's father is targeted by Countess Cassandra. With help from the powerful sorcerer, Valtor, Cassandra enchants King Radius, curses Stella to a monstrous form, and takes over the kingdom essentially. And through the enchantment, King Radius loses all his love for Stella and turns on her, treating her like a horrible monster needing to be disposed of. That's pretty messed up, honestly. The situation preys on Stella's two biggest insecurities. First off, the fear she probably has of losing a parent because of their divorce. And secondly, her appearance. We learn in the season that Stella thinks that people only like her because she's pretty. After all, she wasn't confident in herself until she changed her look entirely. And her own father calling her a hideous monster and turning the royal guard on her doesn't help the situation any. This was a lot to put one of the characters through, so I just had to include it. Now on to Bloom's backstory. Bloom was one of the two princesses of Domino. When she was just a baby, the ancestral witches attacked their kingdom hoping to steal the dragon's flame. In order to protect Bloom, Daphne, her older sister, sent her to Earth. In the original version of the story, Daphne sacrificed herself and was killed by the witches, leaving her in a spirit-like form. The king and queen were devastated, thinking that both of their daughters had been killed by the witches, so they put up a final fight to avenge them, only to get trapped in another realm for almost 20 years. The planet of Domino was completely eradicated of life and became a frozen wasteland. Pretty heavy stuff, especially for Bloom's family. Her parents thought both their children were murdered, and Daphne was actually killed, even if she could linger in her spirit form. But she was stuck like that all alone for 16 years before she ever saw Bloom or anyone else again. Let's cross the last princess off our list, shall we? Aisha's upbringing seems far from happy either. She was trained to be the perfect princess from a very young age, and seems to suffer trauma from this. She has a nightmare where she's being thrown command after command by the palace staff, with her parents nowhere in sight, and they all transform into copies of Darkar, implying that her experiences as a child was unpleasant. In addition to this, Aisha has a very intense fear of darkness. She ties this fear of the dark with the thought of being alone, why were you afraid of going alone? Not of going alone, of being alone. When I was a little girl, my only friend had to move away. Ever since then, I haven't had a single friend I could dance with. Which means that most likely no one was there for her emotionally when she was a child. Parents or palace staff alike. Her only escape was her friend Anne, who taught her how to dance. But Anne eventually moves away, and Aisha felt more alone than ever after that. 
She never had a friend again until she met the Winx about a decade later, and it takes her a while to get over her fear of darkness and being alone. left you behind. Okay, just one more fairy, then we'll move on. Musa's backstory. Musa's parents were both musicians. Her mother was a singer, and I believe her father wrote songs and accompanied her. Musa's parents were very happy for a time, and had a storybook romance to boot. But they started to make less and less money over the years. It got so bad that they barely had enough money to feed themselves. One day, Musa's mother fell unconscious while performing on stage. She was very ill, but Musa's family just didn't have enough money for medicine or treatment. So eventually, she ended up passing, and when Musa was still very young, too. Hobo, Musa's father, is devastated by this and ends up having an episode in front of Musa destroying all of their instruments. He gives up on music forever from this point on. Hobo hates the idea of Musa becoming a singer because of what happened to her mother, but Musa won't give up because music is what connects her to her mother and is a way to honor her memory. Eventually, Hobo realizes this and starts to support Musa, but the story doesn't end there. That would be too easy. In Season 3, the Winx need the Water Stars in order to fight against Valtor. The only way to get them is to pass the Water Star trial. During this test, Musa is reunited with her mother and told that this was her actual mom. She can choose to be with her mother again, but she'd have to give up the Water Stars, putting the magic dimension in danger. Musa does the heroic thing and chooses the Water Stars, and her mother is proud of her for doing so. But this is an incredibly cruel thing to do to someone. Tell them they can be with a long since departed loved one, but at the cost of everyone else's well-being? Yeesh. 7. The Nightmare Episode Anyone who's seen this episode knows why this made the list. The atmosphere for this is probably the creepiest that Winx Club has ever gotten, and the start of the episode sets up the mood perfectly. We begin at Cloud Tower, which has an amazing organ-filled theme, by the way. A window jerks open, and a crow-like creature with a rat tail and glowing red eyes bursts through. The tricks complete a ritual and summon the creepiest-looking creature Winx Club has ever and will ever spawn. It looks sort of like an imp, but it has unsettling, almost baby-like features, very long arms, and an incredibly jagged mouth. It walks on all four legs, but it can crawl walls and even go through them too. The creature jumps out the window, ready to treat the Winx to nightmares customized to tap into each of their worst fears. We cut back to Alfia, and the girls are about to turn in for the night, but things are off. Flora senses that nature seems upset for some reason, and Tecna, who isn't wrong very often, hears a rustling sound, but Bloom shrugs it off. Stella is the first victim to this creature. She has a nightmare that starts with her vainly looking into a mirror, but the mirror transforms into an apparition of her mother and father. They both separate and leave her all alone. The king and queen of Solaria have recently divorced, but Stella still isn't over their separation. The shot we get after the nightmare is straight out of a horror film, where we see the creature hovering over Stella as she sleeps in a very chilling stance. The creature transforms and disappears into the dark of the night. Then Stella starts uncontrollably screaming, prompting the girls to check in on her. Stella can't remember her nightmare, but she claims she felt as though someone was watching her as she slept. Creepy. <laughs> Tekina seems to think that something's strange again, but once again is shrugged off. This time by Musa, they all go back to bed, leaving Stella all alone, since she has no roommate. Poor Stella! And all the while, Murda, a witch who was cursed into a pumpkin form, watches on, unable to say anything. Musa has a next nightmare. Her dream is about her mother who passed away when she was young. 
Misa dreams of her home planet, Melody. She sees her mother sitting on a bench and runs toward her. But as soon as Misa reaches out for her mother, she disappears, leaving Misa all alone. And according to Misa later, the world she was left in was one without music, her worst nightmare. Feeling lost and alone, she screams out Riven's name, and the dream ends. The creature transforms, yet again, into a terrifying, ginormous, insect-like creature with only one giant glowing eye. It crawls the ceiling and finds its way to Tecna and looms over her. Tecna's dream is one of the most unsettling, in my opinion. Tecna's main struggle is that she's too logic-driven and has trouble emoting, so her nightmare is based on that. She becomes wrapped up, almost like a mummy, in a bunch of numbers. She tries to escape, but she's become one with the numbers, and all she can do is scream. The imagery here is really well done. It's pretty unsettling. Tekna then finds herself in a digital world. She sees a familiar face, her love interest Timmy. But he's not human and is drawn with no real eyes on his face. His eyes are in his glasses instead. And once again, the imagery looks great. Tekna goes to check up on Musa after waking up, and Musa claims she feels empty. The rest of the girls meet up because they heard a scream. The girls start to realize that there is something going on, and Flora hears Murda trying to communicate with them. The rest of the episode deals with the Winx coming up with a plan to get rid of the creature. This whole episode is filled with gloriously grim atmosphere, and it's one of my favorites. I recommend you check it out if you haven't seen it. It's a fun episode. Makes you kind of wonder what the series would be like if they leaned more into this darker tone, but with more of a traditional gothic approach. Think Edgar Allan Poe, Frankenstein, and Jekyll and Hyde. And you could go more sci-fi with that tone too. The Martian Chronicles did a great job with that. If you haven't read it before, you might have seen the Spongebob episode Inspired. It's the one where Patrick and Spongebob sneak into Sandy's rocket. They think they landed on the moon, but they're still in Bikini Bottom, so they think the residents of Bikini Bottom are actually aliens. I'd love to see more Winx Club inspired by that kind of storytelling more often. 6. Pixies are tortured and killed off screen. Season 2 was a fairly dark season for Winx Club. Aisha and the Pixies were imprisoned by Darkar. Aisha manages to escape and tries to rescue the Pixies, but she fails and is thrown off a giant cliff by him from a height that she should not have been able to survive. Guess Diaspora took a page out of Darkar's book. Aisha stumbles her way to Alfia College after miraculously surviving, but she's worse for wear. Luckily, the Winx manage to help her. After hearing Aisha's story, the Winx agreed to help rescue the Pixies. The Pixies were kidnapped by Darkar so he could figure out the location of the Codex, and he even tortures them to get the information out of them. And I'm pretty sure it's implied that multiple Pixies were killed by Darkar in the process. Aisha claims that there's only a few Pixies left, and there's another scene that supports this idea. While imprisoned, Lockett is feeling down. She's losing hope, and says she doesn't want to end up like the others. Notice the plural there. The camera then pans on an empty magic jail cell with nothing but clothes left behind. And you can even see this gruesome sight in the background a few times in other scenes. Jeez, that's pretty dark if I do say so myself. It may not have happened on screen, but it is confirmed. Pixies, who are supposed to be the cute magical mascots to the Winx, have been murdered by Darkar while being interrogated. Doesn't get much grimmer than that. 5. Magix is destroyed. Magix is like the main life force of the show. As in, it's a place that's extremely lively, and a lot of good memories were formed there for the main characters. Magix gets completely forgotten in later seasons, but it was a huge part of season 1. It's where the Winx went to hang out after becoming roommates. It's where Bloom and Sky hang out after school. And everyone went to the Festival of the Rose there. All the students from the three nearby schools go to Magix to unwind and just have fun. 
Magix is a huge city that serves as a capital of sorts between realms, and it's full of technological wonders like flying cars. So you start to think of it like the sort of haven, where nothing too horrible can ever happen. But that couldn't be further from the truth. The tricks are able to successfully take over Cloud Tower and create an enormous evil army after stealing Bloom's power in the first season. They plan to rule magics and attack each of the main schools one by one. While war is being waged on Althea College, Sky and Bloom are on a mission to get back her powers in order to put a stop to the tricks. Eventually, they decide to split up. There's a horde of monsters headed straight for magics, and Bloom feels the answer to getting her powers back are in Lake Rukaluchi. So she heads to a lake and Sky goes to protect magics but nothing could prepare him for what he's about to witness. Right before Sky is about to walk into Magix, you can see him smile a bit, because he's in the middle of war, and Magix has always been a safe and nostalgia-ridden place for him. He's excited to take a breather from it all and feels at home, but the smile quickly disappears. The tricks in their army have already reached Magix, and it is left in shambles, abandoned like a ghost town. Sky is in disbelief that such a thing could possibly happen, and the reality of how serious this war is starts to set in. He looks around for any survivors, but there are none. What he finds instead are dozens of cocooned corpses laid about throughout the whole city, and when the camera gets a closer look, you can see the faces, which have open, gaping mouths, as if they're in pain. This is a really serious scene. It's not really confirmed whether these people are alive or not. They don't really look alive to me, and even if they were, they were probably stuck like that for a few days. Plus, we never see the cocoons magically disappear after the Winx managed to beat the tricks. And regardless of whether these people survived or not, the scene is still pretty heavy. And to add to the gravity of it all, my favorite piece from the Winx Club score plays during this scene. Organ and strings quietly drone somberly in the background, and then a single voice harmonizes in such a gut-wrenching way. This is one of my favorite pieces to come from any show. Every time I hear it, I get a little overcome by the emotion put into it. It adds so much to the scene, and I don't think it would be half as impactful without it. 4. Nabu's Death Oh boy, I was not looking forward to rewatching this scene. Season 4 is a very polarizing season for Winx fans. It marked a noticeable change in the series, including a more colorful art style and a seemingly more lighthearted tone. But even so, the villains this season add that usual dark and grim spice that the earlier seasons were known for. I mean, the Wizards of the Black Circle imprisoned the terrestrial fairies in their own castle in order to steal their wings, one by one. But things got personal when it came to Nabu. Let me recap the scenario real quick. The wizards are pretending to surrender to the terrestrial fairies, and are about to go through with a peace ceremony. Ogron gives the black circle to the queen of the terrestrial fairies, which houses the wizard's power. By doing so, a dangerous dimensional portal is opened. It will not shut until the last fairy is dragged into its depths. The only way to stop it is with a strong magical object. So, being the true MVP he is, Nabu offers to seal it using his magical staff. Keep in mind that Aisha and him have just gotten engaged and were planning to live happily on Earth. Nabu just barely manages to shut the portal, but at a cost. All of his energy is drained. With his last words, he tells Aisha not to cry anymore. Luckily, all hope is not lost. The Winx have just received a magical gift that can save one life. Perfect! Nabu is saved! All's right with the world again! So Aisha asks for the gift, and it appears. But at the last minute, Ogron snatches it away. And what does he do with it? He uses it to revive a small, dying flower as Aisha watches helplessly. This, in my opinion, is the most cruel thing a villain on the show has ever done. 
I couldn't believe it when I saw this unfold before my then 11 year old eyes. How could this be? Surely he'll come back somehow. What about Bloom's healing powers the writers conveniently forgot? Maybe Navi was too far gone for her to heal him, but they should have said so. Moving on from plot inconsistencies, the reaction to Nabu's death are heartbreaking. Sky immediately plummets to the ground and shows more emotion through body language than any Winx character ever has and ever will. Not only did he lose a friend, but Sky is like the leader of the specialists. Nabu may have been a sorcerer, but he was still a part of the team. So Sky just lost a teammate under his watch. Aisha, of course, is devastated and she takes Nabu's words to heart. She stops her tears and turns to anger instead. She wants revenge and vows to destroy the Wizards of the Black Circle. And then Riven, the hot-headed and insensitive one of all people, tells Aisha that Nabu wouldn't have wanted that. Nabu wouldn't have wanted that. Revenge is never the right way to go, Layla. Then we have nothing else to say to each other. I have never felt more for Riven than I do during this season. Yes, he's way too sensitive and lashes out, but Nabu is helping him get better, and they were extremely close, probably the closest friend that Riven ever had. What personally got me even more emotional than this scene is the beginning of the following episode. It's really well done in my opinion. We see the Winx and Specialist camped out on the beach. They had trouble sleeping and were comforting each other through their grief throughout the night. Bloom goes over to Skye and has a very raw and honest heart-to-heart. -heart. She's still processing what happened. The Winx have always gone up against villains for years now, but even so, they always came out okay in the end. So she had no idea that one day they'd actually lose someone. And she brings up how Aisha and Nabu had so many plans together. What follows is a montage of everyone remembering Nabu. Throughout it, we cut back to the Winx and Specialists. The first cut is to Brandon holding Stella while crying silently. The second is Musa walking the beach. What she finds really broke me up. Riven's at the end of the beach all alone by himself, and he's crying. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the only time we ever see him cry. He normally hides his feelings as best as he can, and does so by snapping at people. But this tearful moment is earned. He lost his best friend after all. Maybe the only friend he ever had. And probably the only person other than Musa who actually believed in him and helped him become a better person. This whole ordeal is truly heartbreaking, but Riven's reaction really got to me. To make matters worse, they bring back Nabu for one last scene in season five. The Winx are being tormented with visions to prey on their weaknesses. The others are all relatively tame, until we get to Aisha. Her vision is of Nabu. She's thrilled to see him again, but then the vision tells her that she let him die. Dang, that's cutting pretty deep, Nickelodeon. Aisha sees through this eventually, but still. Three. The Tricks Tormenting Riven Riven is a pretty decisive character. You either love him or you hate him. But regardless of what side of the fence you're on, we can probably agree on one thing. Riven goes too far sometimes. I personally have a soft spot for Riven's character. While I don't think he and Musa should be a thing without serious changes made to their dynamic, I still think that his character is very interesting and has huge potential. Riven is often making snarky remarks, and always makes his opinion known one way or the other. This results in him starting a lot of fights with the other characters, but throughout the first season we can see that he genuinely just wants to be appreciated, and feels left out, like an outsider, case in point the Festival of the Rose episode. But sadly Riven's defensiveness gets the better of him, so much so that he betrays his friends and joins forces with the tricks. Darcy uses her powers of illusion and deception to keep Riven compliant, but eventually he reaches a breaking point and tries to cut off ties with the evil witches after they take over Cloud Tower and make plans to take over magics. After standing up to the tricks, 
Merlin realizes that they never truly cared for him one bit, and he's thrown into a prison cell by the same people that he reached out to, because he felt his real friends didn't care for him. After rotting away in a cell for some time, the tricks decide to torment him for laughs. This is one of my favorite scenes in all of Winx Club. It's unsettling, introspective, and makes me truly feel for Riven's character. If they had written Riven's character better from this point onward, I feel like more people would like him. This was his chance to start a new leaf and make amends with everyone. Let's go over the scene in question. A bunch of clones of Riven surround him in a very disapproving stance. Then each clone is morphed into a hideous monster, which melt together into a single giant creature. This creature mirrors Riven's every move. The tricks are getting inside Riven's head and trying to tell him that he's a monster with no feeling whatsoever. A monster with no chance of redemption. Riven at this point has started to realize what a terrible mistake he made, abandoning his friends and helping out the tricks. And for a moment, he plays into the Trix's trap. But Riven's doubts about his irredeemability are gone once he remembers his friends and realizes that he is different from the monster standing in front of him. Riven stares the monster, dead in the eye, and opens up about his feelings for the very first time. Yes, he did a horrible thing. And yes, his friends might not forgive him, but he knows now that they did truly care about him and Riven admits how he really does care deep down. He still has a heart. Then the monster disappears. This is such a good scene. It shows such self-awareness from Riven, and it's a great visual representation of how twisted up inside he is. It also shows just how evil the tricks are. They disposed of Riven instantly and even tormented him, feeding on his worst insecurities. 2. Tecna's Death This was quite the gutsy move by Winx Club writers. Killing off one of the main characters, showing how the rest of the cast deals with her death, assuring the audience that she really was dead. Of course it wasn't true, but they kept up the charade for about four episodes, and it left quite the emotional impact. Of course, this moment came from season three. The stakes were pretty high this season. The Winx find themselves in Andros, which is where the portal to the Omega Dimension is located. The portal is about to close, which means the end to both Andros and the Omega Dimension. The Winx hurry off to Aisha's home planet to try to help. While there, they meet a wizard who was sent there to remedy the situation. Luckily, the wizard was the one who created the portal. Convenient. And he has a scroll that might be able to destroy it entirely. But just as he's about to finish the incantation, powerful winds sweep the scroll away. Now the only way to shut the portal is to close it from the inside. That would mean being trapped forever in the icy Omega Dimension, where the worst criminals of the universe are held. Bloom, of course, offers to do this, so that Andrus won't be destroyed like her home was 16 years ago. But Andrus is Aisha's planet and responsibility, so she tries to take up the mission instead. Neither Winx is the one to close the portal, however. Tecna takes up the task, summoning great courage. Aisha tries to stop her, but the wizard intervenes, saying that this could be Tecna's destiny. Tecna, the always reliable, manages to close the portal and even earns her enchantix. But at the last moment, she's sucked into the portal as it closes forever. This scene hits pretty hard emotionally, not gonna lie. The Winx are horrified by what they just witnessed and start screaming and crying uncontrollably. It is a little hammed up, but I'd prefer that over not enough emotion whatsoever. It's heartbreaking to see all of Tecna's friends in such great pain and sorrow. And it doesn't end there, folks. Over the next few episodes, we see how everyone reacts to the news about Tecna. The Winx are still horribly shaken up, and Aisha feels incredible guilt that she didn't close the portal instead. The specialists are torn up too, but try their best to move on. All but Timmy, that is, Tecna's love interest. He refuses to give up on her and spends days doing his best to pick up some kind of signal that she's still alive somewhere. The other specialists think that he's pushing himself too hard. 
and that he needs to accept what happened. But Timmy still refuses to give up. Eventually, the Winks lend a hand in helping him track down Tecna. And to do this, they feed data into a device using the emotions that Timmy feels for Tecna. This scene is really touching. Tecna and Timmy are the socially awkward pair and a bit inept when it comes to sharing their feelings. So to see Timmy initially struggle, but end up gushing his heart out about all the things he loves about Tecna when we still don't know if she's alive or not, is incredibly heartwarming and wholesome. Well, I love that she can add numbers in her head, no matter how large. I love that she always beats me in video games and never apologizes for it. And she's not just my girlfriend, she's my best friend. You really love a lot of things about her. Yeah, I'm totally in love with her. This whole ordeal is tear-worthy, honestly. Eventually, Tekna is found. But the fact the writers managed to trick the audience into questioning if she's actually alive and the way they touch on grief and acceptance made it a no-brainer to put it on this list. One, Valtor blinds Aisha. This one builds off of what I already mentioned about Aisha's upbringing. As I said, Aisha has a phobia of darkness. It makes her feel incredibly alone and reminds her of her childhood when she didn't have any friends and her parents weren't around. She was able to get over this fear by the second season, but we circle straight back in the next one. Aisha stands up to Valtor and challenges him, and then he does something that immediately cements Valtor as an incredibly cruel villain. Instead of a normal magical battle, like you might expect, Valtor curses Aisha instead, and with blindness of all things. It's scary enough losing one of your senses so suddenly like that, but Aisha's innate fear of darkness makes this even worse. The one thing she's most afraid of she was forced to endure at all times. She eventually is cured by fairy dust, of course, but the fact that she had to go through all of this is pretty dark. And the imagery used to show just how terrified she is after being cursed hits home. We also see the aftermath of all of this. Of course, the Winks try their best to comfort her, but what personally hurts more is to see Griselda's reaction. Griselda is infamous for being a huge stickler for the rules and incredibly bossy. She's normally the one who puts the Winks in their place, She's about to do so until she sees Aisha. She goes completely silent and has such a hurt and defeated look on her face. She holds her tongue until Farragonda is able to cure Aisha, and Griselda looks incredibly concerned for the girl. This is one of the only times we see Griselda show her softer and caring side, and it's because of just how horrible the circumstances are. And that's all we'll talk about today. That was a long one. Rest in peace, my voice. But I had a lot to say about the subject. Yes, Winx Club writing isn't the greatest. There's cheesy and awkward lines and plenty of plot holes to be sure. But there are times when the writing is done extremely well and I wanted to gush about it for a bit. Thank you for watching and hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to see more videos from me, then please subscribe so you can join me for the journey to come. And once again, if you'd like to support my channel, you can donate by going to my Ko-fi page, which is linked in the description. I still have plenty of Winx videos in the works, but I'm also currently scripting videos for Lolly Rock and Star Darlings, so stay tuned for that. Times are tough, so don't forget to keep a little magic in your life. Till next time, guys. Bye!